Well, welcome back, guys. And I do hope, as ever, you and your family are keeping well during this uh, lockdown period. So what we're going to do today is the fifth and last lesson on capacitors. And we're going to look this time at charging capacitors, how they charge, and then we'll end by looking at one or two interesting uses of capacitors. OK, so let's kick off by looking at a circuit to charge capacitors. Now, uh, in previous videos, we spent a lot of time looking at how capacitors discharge. Um, and uh, it seems odd that we started with that. But you'll see why uh, we left charging until the end. So uh, you're very familiar with the circuits now. So there's our power supply, a source of EMF, uh, a switch to get it charged. And then for the sake of this bit of teaching, I'm going to have our capacitor there and I'm going to charge it through a resistor. Right, uh, so there's our capacitor. Uh, so we've got the voltage or potential difference of the power supply, we'll call that V0. We've got our capacitor here and we've got our resistor there. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at what happens when we first turn on this circuit. Okay, now just remember the capacitor's not charged. So um, I'd like you to think about it, uh, think of one of the plates, think of the one that becomes negative. It's got no extra electrons on it, so electrons will rush in, but as the electrons build up on that plate, they will repel the ones that are trying to come in, so less and less electrons will come in per second. So let's now analyse what happens when we switch that switch on, when we close that switch. Right, so let's switch on and try and explain what happens. I suppose more correctly, I should say, how we can model what happens uh, with the charge and the voltages involved in this circuit. So here we go. Uh, let's uh, switch on. Uh, so more correctly, what we're doing here is uh, closing the switch. Now, what we need to look at first is at the very moment we turn it on, okay? So we're going to look at what happens at time t equals zero. So at time t equals zero, in other words, t zero, um, I'll make that very clear, that's the moment it comes on. because things are going to change. So the very moment it comes on, uh, I'd like you to think of the capacitor as being empty, having no charge on it, so no repulsion for charge rushing in. So charge sees it as a, as a perfect conductor. Isn't that odd? Yeah, charge can get into it quite easily. Current can flow quite easily, but it can't because it's limited by this resistance in series. Uh, do imagine that it's a perfect source of EMF. In other words, the internal uh, resistance of the battery uh, can be considered to be zero, okay, for the teaching I'm doing at the moment. So at the very moment we turn on, yeah, V equals IR. So V equals IR. And uh, the voltage will all appear across the resistor. OK, so we can say that V0 equals IR, and that's right at the start. Now, if you think about it, as time goes along, so then, in other words, sort of a little bit later, OK, uh, we can see that as the capacitor begins to charge, the current will drop. Of course, I wanted to make the point here that this I uh, is in the whole circuit, OK, it's not just the current through the resistor, it's the uh, sort of current through the capacitor. OK, um, that's quite a complex idea to get in your head. It's the charging current. Um, we have something called displacement current at university, uh, but we don't need to do that. OK, so what happens as time ticks away? Well, you know that the current in a circuit 
will be governed by the time constant. In other words, the capacitance multiplied by the resistance. So the I at any time will be what it was at the start, I naught, reduced exponentially by E to the minus, that's the reduction, the time you leave it running for, divided by the capacitance multiplied by the resistance of the circuit. Okay. Now, I think you know this, that as the capacitor charges, okay, sort of similar to discharge, yeah, the current will drop and drop and drop until the capacitor is fully charged. Um, you understand what I mean by fully charged for that voltage, for that potential difference. And then the potential difference across the battery will be the same as across the capacitor. So they'll be sort of back-to-back uh, -back with each other. In other words, no electrons will transfer. So finally, after a longer time, the current in the circuit will be zero. But what I'd like to look at now is how does the voltage change? And of course, the capacitor is charging, so the voltage will build up across the capacitor. So we're going to look now at how the voltage behaves in this circuit. And um, interestingly enough, I said that the voltage will build up across the capacitor, which indeed it does. And therefore, I think Kirchhoff's second law, it will have to drop across the resistor. And that makes it easy to write an equation. Because the voltage, as time ticks away, across the resistor will be equal to the voltage it had across it at the start, which will be the whole of the voltage of the battery, the EMF of the battery. But as time goes on, that voltage will drop, okay, exponentially, E, and I think uh, you've probably guessed it, to the minus T upon C R, okay? Now, if you're sort of struggling to get your head around that one, remember that the voltage across the resistor must drop because the current through it drops, okay? So these two equations, yep, both decrease with time. And hopefully uh, you have a good understanding of these kind of equations now. And you can see they represent negative power here. You can see they represent a multiplier that reduces this number. So now let's have a look a little bit further at how the voltage across the charging capacitor behaves. OK, so now let's look at how the voltage behaves across the capacitor. And in fact, it's a little bit easier uh, than you might think. OK, so there are some things that we know. Yeah? We know that the voltage across the capacitor plus the voltage across the resistor must at all times equal the voltage or the potential difference of the battery, in other words, the EMF of the battery. Okay, that's kind of Kirchhoff's second law, that the voltage potential difference across this one plus that one must equal that one. Okay, but we're trying to drag out what's the voltage across the capacitor. So, the voltage across the capacitor must be equal to the voltage of the power supply minus the voltage across the resistor. And it's this nice little uh, arrangement here, this little formula, that we're going to use to work out what the voltage will be across the capacitor at all times. Because if you look carefully, we know, well, we know this value, yeah, that's the fixed value of the power supply, and we know the value of the voltage across the capacitor at all times, because here it is. So we can write an, a new equation to show us what the voltage across the capacitor will be at all times. So now we have expressions for the voltage across the resistor and the voltage across the capacitor. Let's substitute this in here for the voltage across the resistor. So as the capacitor charges, yep, the voltage across the capacitor will be the voltage of the power supply 
I keep saying voltage, you understand I do mean potential difference, okay? Minus, okay, the voltage across the resistor, which is V naught E to the minus T upon C R, okay? And um, this is the one that's getting lower and lower with time, okay? So the voltage across the capacitor is getting closer and closer to that of the power supply. Finally, you'll notice there's a V naught here and a V naught there. So let's simplify this one a little bit. The voltage across the capacitor will be equal to V naught multiplied by one minus E to the power T upon C R. Um, I hope you've, you now have a really good understanding of what all these letters are in the equation. Okay, so um, if this number is getting smaller and smaller and smaller with time, yeah, then uh, one minus it is basically the number one. So after a longish period of time, the voltage across the capacitor will be the voltage of the power supply. The capacitor will have fully charged up for that voltage. So I've just indicated here that this bit here goes down with time. So we know what happens if we wait a long period of time. So I'll put it down here. Finally, if we wait uh, long enough, VC will be equal to V naught. The voltage across the capacitor will be the voltage across the power supply and we know that that is the EMF of the power supply because we're not drawing any current. The capacitor is now fully charged and the current in the circuit is now zero and it's sitting there waiting to be discharged across an external load. So now let's look at this graphically. And if you can remember, graphs are brilliant ways of showing how things change, and in this case, how they change with time. So I'm gonna sketch a graph axis here, which is gonna be potential difference against time. Remembering that the potential difference, uh, the battery does not change. So here's our time axis. And here's our potential difference axis. So it's the PD in volts. Okay. And uh, what we want to do is we want to look at what happens to the voltage across the resistor with time. Well, if you remember, the capacitor charges up and gets more and more of the voltage. So less and less and less appears across the resistor until the current in the circuit is zero, and then V equals I R, yeah, the I will be zero, so the voltage will be zero across the R, across the resistor. So to start off with, I hope you remember that the uh, voltage across the resistor will be V naught, okay? And then as time ticks along, that will drop away exponentially, so I'm gonna go over here to draw that depending on the time constant of the circuit. There we go. Okay, not a brilliant curve, but the best I can do. So remember that this here, yeah, this line here is V on the resistor. Okay, but now think what happens to the voltage on the capacitor. Well, the, uh, voltage that has disappeared from the resistor must now be across the capacitor. And if you wait long enough, all of the voltage will be across the capacitor and not across the resistor. So I'm gonna draw myself uh, a little sort of helpful construction line here. This is just to sort of help me get it right. Okay. And then if you think about it, the capacitor is going to charge up so the capacitor is going to start off with no voltage on it and the voltage is going to build up and build up and build up like 
like this. Okay. So I'll just label this graph so we're clear. This is the voltage across the capacitor. And of course, I hope you remember that if we were to add those values, yeah, add the value of the voltage across the resistor and voltage across the capacitor, that would always equal the voltage of the power supply and the power supply's EMF. So, nice little graph that, showing the equations of a capacitor charging. Um, there's just a few things I would like to note here. So, let's just finally look and at the equations that apply here. Um, and I think this will make sense to you now because we've done quite a bit of this. So, we know the voltage across the capacitor will be the voltage of the power supply. Yep. And multiply by 1 minus E to the minus T upon CR. Okay. In other words, this sort of represents what's being lost um, across the resistor. Okay. But interestingly enough, the charge will build up on the capacitor. Yeah. So the charge on the capacitor. And you need the flexibility to see uh, the sort of uh, similarity of how things go, okay, will also vary in the same way, okay. So uh, the charge will build up and build up. So Q, now I'm going to call this, some people call it Q naught, but I think that's a bit confusing because that would be the charge on the capacitor at time equals naught. This is the total charge. Okay, after waiting a long period of time. Okay, this is sort of where T equals infinity, if you saw what I mean. Well, the charge will build up on the capacitor. There we go. Okay, and why do these equations look similar? Well, I'm sure you know, but the main thing to point out is that Q on a capacitor is equal to a constant C, its capacitance, multiplied by the voltage across it. So there's a linear connection between whatever the Q value is at any time and the voltage across the capacitor at any time. So what you notice here, of course, is both of these rise with time. So I hope you've got a good understanding there of the equations that describe how voltage rises on a capacitor when it charges and how the charge also rises, I suppose which one causes which, the charge causes the voltage, and a graphical look at how that works. So now let's finally look at two uses of capacitors. And the first one we're going to look at is a discharging capacitor uh, to produce rapid pulses of energy. And we're going to look at the camera flash. Um, you need a bit of flexibility here, of course, because we could use a capacitor, a very large capacitor bank, to create a pulse that's used in a particle accelerator. Or uh, some of the work that's being done now on nuclear fusion, we could use a capacitor bank, that would be a large capacitance, to provide a pulse of energy um, to crush uh, a pellet of deuterium or something like that, uh, to try and cause or induce fusion. Um, in other words, what we're doing there is we're firing off some very high-powered lasers. So let's have a look at uh, the circuit we're going to use. So you'll be familiar with this, uh, with a few slight differences. Here's the power supply, and I'm going to draw a switch here and come across to my capacitor circuit. So, um, here's my capacitor. There we go, and um, 
you can see straight away uh, that uh, closing this switch will charge the capacitor. And I think it's important I write that on uh, because we might lose sight of that. Okay, so that's the switch that will charge it. Now, we're gonna have a second switch in the circuit over here. And this switch will connect the capacitor across the flash lamp of the camera. Now, I don't wanna get into detail about what that lamp is, and this is a massive simplification, but it's good enough for uh, A-level and a bit of teaching, as it were. Um, so, uh, we have a Xenon flash tube in a camera. Um, all I'm gonna draw, really, here is a glass tube. Okay, uh, it doesn't conduct electricity because it's full of a gas that is not ionized. Okay, and sometimes we just put a little dot in there to show that that's a glass tube uh, with some gas in it. But if we put a high enough voltage across it, we'll rip electrons off the gas in there and we'll ionize that gas. And when it recombines, it will give out a flash of light. So, here we go, photons coming off this once it's switched on. So there's our flash. Okay, so um, we're going to charge up our capacitor and it's going to charge very rapidly because you can see the resistance of the circuit is very low. And then we're going to open that switch and close this one and dump the energy of this capacitor through uh, this uh, flash light, okay? Now you might say, well, isn't that a very high resistance? It is, but if the voltage is high enough, it'll ionize the gas, the gas will become incredibly conducting, the resistance in this circuit will be very, very low. CR will be a very small number, never mind how big your capacitor is, the resistance here is very low, so it will discharge very rapidly, release all of its energy, in a very short space of time and flash, we'll get a flash of light out of this. So, before I move on, uh, let me just write on there that you now understand that these switches are used alternately to charge and then it's opened and then discharge the capacitor through the flash lamp. Um, I'm really itching to say here, in a real camera flash, it's somewhat more complicated than this. Uh, this circuit suggests I can just charge, discharge, charge, discharge. I can have rapid flashes. Uh, but in fact, uh, camera flash uses a little bit more of a complex circuit. But this would work, okay? If we set this up correctly, it would actually work. So let's see if we can look at this mathematically and explain what's happening and see how we can get a very high power flash out of this circuit. So you understand the circuit now we've got for our flash system and I'm going to put some values on it and show that we can get a high powered flash, a flash of energy out of it. So uh, let's make our uh, battery or power supply easy number 10 volts. So there's a potential difference there of 10 volts. And let's make our capacitor value quite large. It's not unreasonably large, but let's make the capacitance 6,000 micro farads okay right now we're going to discharge it very quickly you can see or I explained that the time constant here is very very short so um, let's let's discharge in a millisecond so we'll discharge one millisecond Okay, you've got to be careful how you write uh, seconds there. So, let's see what happens. Well, you know the power in any circuit, yeah, P is equal to I V, but I'm going to suggest that that formula is not a lot of help to us because the current, if you remember, changes exponentially. It's not a fixed current. Um, so we won't use that formula to work out the power of the flash. There's nothing wrong with the formula, it's just not very helpful um, 
because current changes with time in this circuit. Okay, so uh, let's just remind ourselves that power is energy transferred, sometimes W, yeah, work per unit time. Okay, so what we can do is we can say, okay, how much energy was released from the capacitor in the time we let it come out of the capacitor in? And we know the formula for the energy stored on a capacitor. It's a half C V squared. So let's do that next. So let's work out the power of this flash. So the energy that was stored on the capacitor is a half C V squared. Okay. And if we work out how much energy is stored on this capacitor, it's equal to a half times the capacitance. We've gone for a large capacitance. Uh, so we can get uh, a largish energy out for the size of the capacitor times by the voltage squared. Okay. Now, um, I uh, put the microfarads in there just to remind you that uh, lots of students forget and put 6,000 in. So remember what you're going to put in your calculator is a half times by C times by V squared, okay? Uh, watch out for kilo volts as well, that often comes up. And I hope you're not surprised that the energy that's stored on the capacitor here, when you work all this out, E is a very small number, okay? It's only about 0 0.3 joules. Now, when I first started doing this when I was quite young, I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand how you could have like megawatt lasers without them having their own power stations, if you see what I mean. Um, and then, of course, I realized that the lasers, the camera flashes, pulse. They go blip, 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 blip. They're not on all of the time. OK, so if you have a megawatt laser, yeah, it would give out a million joules in a second, but you don't leave it on for a second. And that's the key to this camera flash, of course, because what we're going to do is we're going to discharge the capacitor through the, uh, the lamp, and we're going to do it in a very short space of time. So the power is the energy divided by the time, so 0 0.3 joules given out in one millisecond, one times 10 to the minus three seconds. And now can you see how it works? The power released will be 300 joules per second, 300 watts. So your camera flash will give a pulse of light that's equivalent to having a, a light bulb on for one second which would give 3, uh, sorry, 300 joules out, okay? But the power is still 300 joules per second because we've got less energy, but we give it out in a very short space of time. So it is a high-powered pulse, okay? Now, just to end on this, uh, just imagine if we did this. I was talking, thinking about the um, high-powered lasers. What would happen if we discharged in one microsecond? Okay, can you see the power then? The time is a thousand times shorter, so the power would be 300,000 watts. And that's how you can use a capacitor to create very, very short bursts of energy, but because of the short time, the power is exceptionally high.
So we're almost there, guys. We've almost finished capacitors. But before we do, let's look at one final use, which is quite important. OK, so what we're going to look at is capacitors used in this rather wonderful physics term way, smoothing, power supply smoothing. So to give you some background on this, a lot of the devices that we use in the laboratory here or that we use at home plug into the mains, but we don't want mains electricity out of them. We want a lower voltage and we want it DC. A classic case would be charging a mobile phone. Yeah, we plug it into the mains. OK, and the mains is about 220 volts oscillating up and down 50 times a second, 50 hertz or 60 in America. And we want to reduce that voltage firstly uh, to a voltage that's sort of safe for charging our phone. So uh, shall we suggest we drop to uh, 10 volts? Now, how we do that could be uh, a transformer. Um, typically, we use... Um, more uh, modern methods than just a step down transformer but you get the idea and the trouble is the battery needs DC so we now need to reduce that voltage to uh, 10 volts DC or approximately 10 volts now the mains electricity was dropped uh, with a step down transformer in the power supply um, to 10 volts but it still contains that 50 hertz on off cycling the mains frequency. And if we just turn that into DC, some of this uh, up and down nature of the wave, yeah, with a time period of a 50th of a second, will appear on the DC. In other words, the DC won't be completely smooth. It will have some ripple. And it's going to be a capacitor that we're going to use to get rid of that ripple. So what we'll do is explain how that works now. So let's look at a fairly simple power supply circuit and designing power supplies is a black art in its own right. So I'm going to go really simple here. Yeah. So I'm going to look at sort of this bit. In other words, we've already stepped down the AC and what we've now got is a low voltage AC power supply. So let's have our 10 volts AC and that will have the 50 Hertz nature to it okay and we want to turn that AC into DC and I wonder whilst I'm drawing if you can guess how we're going to go about doing that so there we go I'll just remind ourselves that's a 50 Hertz cycle that's quite important in the UK so how do we turn AC into DC well because it's uh, traveling in one direction and then back and then backwards and forwards 50 times a second then surely the way we can do that is with a diode so if I put a diode in the circuit here uh, these diodes will have to be capable of carrying quite high current in some power supplies not particularly high in a mobile phone okay so here's my diode it doesn't have to be an LED just a one-way electrical device and then um, I'm going to draw the, um, the power supply uh, sort of output part of the circuit as being a capacitor in parallel with a resistor. You're so used to that sort of circuit. OK, so there we go. There's our capacitor. And uh, we're going to take our voltage out of here. Or more correctly, we should say that the potential difference will appear across those two points. OK, so there's our capacitor and there's our resistor and this is a diode. So um, have a look at that circuit. Now, it really isn't as complicated as it, as it looks. OK, forget the capacitor and the resistor for a minute. If you just had the diode, okay? If you think about it, what would happen is the AC signal would only come through when positive. So you get a hump, nothing, a hump, nothing. In other words, you get peak, level, peak, level, okay? In other words, what you get out of this is not the peak and the trough, but you would just get the peak and then a level bit, the peak 
and then the negative bit is cancelled. Okay, so this is one of the world's simplest designs of uh, power supply, and this type of power supply gives you half of the wave. Okay, so this power supply is a half wave rectifier. Okay, uh, rectify to sort out. Okay, um, if any of you watch um, Electro Boom's um, wonderful uh, YouTube channel, okay, he calls himself the rectifier when he uh, sorts out people who have said things that are wrong to do with electricity and energy. To sort out uh, the voltage, it's kind of really old fashioned terminology. OK, and not something you really need to know for for a level. But I hope you can see that that circuit will allow current to pass through it in one direction. So you'll get the positive peaks, but you won't get the troughs. So basically, the voltage stays positive, which is what we want. That's the nature of DC. But it's still got this lump, lump, lump nature to it. OK, it's still got some ripple and it's the capacitor that we use to get rid of that ripple. Um, I can't resist saying that if we put more diodes in here and a little bit more of a complex arrangement we can not only get the positive peak but we can get the negative peak as well inverted so it goes hump 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 without the gap in between and that would be a full wave rectifier okay the trouble is you've still got loads of ripple on that full wave rectifier, but I suppose what you're doing is you're getting twice the power, so they're more um, typical in circuits. Right, so let's have a look graphically at what happens to the voltages at different points in our circuit. So what we're going to do now is analyse the voltages at different points in this circuit and see why the capacitor and its associated resistor are really, really important. And I've drawn myself some axes here to get started because this is not particularly easy for me to draw. So let's have a look at the input voltage. Yeah, so this voltage here. Um, now you know that that's pure AC. So what you're going to get is the AC wave doing that sort of thing, where the oscillation is uh, at 50 hertz, okay? So, that's here in the circuit. Then we go through the diode, okay? So, um, this is um, sort of out of the diode. So, if we only had a diode in this circuit, so if we literally just put a diode there and made sure the electricity only flowed in the positive direction, it sounds a bit like DC, I think you can see what happens. You would only get the positive peaks, okay? Now, um, to make this uh, easy on myself, I'm gonna draw a few little construction lines here uh, because I don't think you'd be asked to draw this in an exam, um, but as a teacher, it's quite tricky to get this right, so. I'm going to just do this to make sure I keep the time period of the wave constant. There we go. Okay. Now, we're going through a diode. So if we go through a diode, uh, we'll assume there's no loss of voltage uh, in the diode. So we're just here in the circuit. So we're going to let the electricity through when it's positive, And then it won't go back. And then through when it's positive, and then it won't go back because of the nature of the diode. Okay, so can you see that this is DC? Just drop the pen lid, it's DC, but it's got this ripple on it. The DC is not staying at a constant voltage. So what we've got to do now is put the resistor and capacitor into the circuit and see how it helps to keep the DC voltage pretty constant it gets rid of the ripple, it smooths the output of the power supply. Okay, so we've got the input to the power supply, we've got the output from the diode, and I will just remind you, we could assume that would be with no smoothing circuit, so no capacitor. 
and now let's bolt on the CR circuit. Let's see what happens if we have the smoothing capacitor. So this graph is going to be with the capacitor. Okay, now to help me construct this, I'm going to draw the sine wave that we had originally. Okay, as best I can. And uh, now for the clever bit. We're never going to get that and that because those voltages don't pass through the diode. But something really clever happens here. And I wonder if you can see what it is. Okay. Uh, the way to teach this is to go, okay, so imagine the output of the diode is at the highest point. There. Okay, at that time. Now, this voltage would drop away, but do you remember that when the voltage was at the highest point, there was a voltage across the resistor and across the capacitor. The capacitor charges very quickly. Okay, the charging is quite quick, we could say. But when the voltage drops away, the capacitor will start to discharge across these two wires. In other words, as the voltage drops away, the capacitor will slowly, slowly, slowly make up for that loss. And the really important thing here is that we make CR very, very large. That it doesn't discharge rapidly and the capacitor is completely empty, but the capacitor is a large enough value to hold the voltage up for a while as it discharges. Now, this is not an easy thing to draw, but you can imagine the capacitor discharging through the resistor. I'm massively overemphasizing here. And then the power supply comes back. And then as it starts to drop away, the capacitor starts to discharge again. Now, uh, you can see here that it was discharging and then the power supply goes positive again uh, there. Now, um, I have massively overemphasized this, but can you imagine that if the uh, time constant of this circuit was very, very large compared to the weight that you have between cycles? So make C R large. Yep, that's the time constant. Okay. Then what will happen is this slope will be much less steep. So it'll go up and then much less steep. In other words, we've removed an awful lot of the ripple from the AC. Now, um, I think my diagram shows that we haven't completely removed the ripple, and I've sort of overemphasized it here. Uh, but if you look at the diagram, uh, you will notice there's a drop between the voltage here and there, and this is typically what we call the ripple voltage that remains. Let's write that a bit more clearly. That is a little bit tough uh, for A-level, uh, but I would look at that power supply and I would go, yeah, OK, we've taken AC, we've turned it into uh, one directional AC, we've turned it into smoothed out DC, but I think I need to change my CR value because if I'm using it for uh, charging or especially in electronics in my lab, there is too much ripple here. OK, we need to just raise that curve a bit by increasing the value of that capacitance. Uh, in some ways, getting it to kind of, um, you know, hold its voltage up for a bit longer. So um, I think this is sort of unlikely to come up at A level, uh, but it is mentioned in the textbook. And um, certainly I built a lot of little power supplies when I was younger for my electronics kits. And I really did have to understand this sort of thing. And to be honest with you, if the school power supplies are a little bit ripply, you can actually hear it sometimes with the DC. Then all you do is get the terminals of the power supply and just connect a big capacitor across the output terminals. And usually that reduces the ripple quite considerably.
Good, so there we go. That's the fifth and final lesson on capacitors. I do hope you understood that and I hope you found the whole series on capacitors and capacitance useful. Uh, we've kind of got to tackle electric fields now, so maybe I'll make some videos on electric fields. Anyway, as ever, enjoy your physics and I'll see you next time.